Well, Lord, uh, thanks for this awesome summer day, for this uh, place where we can meet, for this, uh, this community of people that you've drawn together from all walks of life, and uh, most of all for your love toward us, which is why we're here. And uh, we're here because you've loved us and also because you've communicated about that love in your word. And I pray that as we open the scriptures today that you'd speak very clearly to us and that you would uh, encourage and draw near each of us to you. And uh, uh, yeah, help us to understand and to get out of this passage what you want us to get from it. Amen. All right, so this series that we're in, Jesus One-on-One, we're looking at stories in the New Testament where Jesus has interactions with an individual person, which is actually quite a few of. And they are, you know, they're, they're sometimes moving. They're almost always insightful because you see this, you know, if you imagine what would it be like for for God to interact with an individual person. We learn about God through it. We learn about His uh, mission of salvation. And, and often we learn about ourselves as, as these interactions kind of hold up a mirror. And I think that'll be the case today as well. We're going to be in Luke chapter 22. And this is now at the end of Jesus' ministry. And so this is the scene where... Uh, where Jesus is having a Passover meal with his disciples. And it's like the last time that he's really going to have all of them together before he goes to the cross. So it's this fateful evening. And there's all kinds of stuff that happens. You know, the, uh, the bread and the wine, and he reveals that someone's going to betray him, which is Judas. And then in verse 28, he says this. He says, You are the ones who have stood by me in my trials. And just as my Father has granted me a kingdom, I grant you that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. And you will sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. She's like, you guys have suffered with me through all these trials and there will be an eternal reward for it. That's the, the context. And then he does something kind of, something I think would have been a little shocking, which is that then he addresses one man sitting at the table. And he says, Simon, Simon, behold. And you know, when we read through these, we're like, okay, Simon, Simon, behold. And then he says something to him. But like, you got to put yourself there in the moment. It would be kind of uncomfortable. You know, imagine if there's, there's 12 of us sitting there all together, you know. And I turn to one person, Glenn Blumel. And I say, Glenn, Glenn. Behold, you know, it's like, this is heavy, okay? Everyone's sitting there. You guys have suffered with me, but Simon, listen. You know what behold means? It means, it means you're going to be amazed by what I say next. It means brace yourself. Simon, brace yourself. Satan has demanded to sift you men like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail, and you, when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Now, he's saying this to Simon Peter specifically, who we talked about actually earlier in this series. Simon's the the fisherman. If you remember when, uh, you know, they were fishing and didn't catch anything, and Jesus says, throw your nets in again, and they bring up all these fish, and Jesus is like, you're the Lord. And and Jesus has called him to follow him. He is this super passionate, super, um, uh, you know, impulsive, maybe rash, sometimes foolish, but but fiercely loyal follower of Christ. And, And he's the one, his name is Simon, but Jesus said, you shall be called Peter, which means rock, because on this rock I'm going to build my church. And so he has this promise that he's going to be used. And so now Jesus turns to him and says, you've been with me through all of us, but Simon, listen to me. Satan is going to sift you like wheat. Which, uh, you know, they would have understood the illustration maybe better than we do. Sifting wheat is just part of the process of 
of harvesting it. But it's, it's pretty far along in the process. When you harvest grain, you got these big stalks, and you have to somehow get the kernels out to be used into flour or whatever. And so what you do, there's three steps to that. The first step is that you have to crush it. They would, they would literally take what they harvested and have their oxen trample over it to crush loose the kernels, or sometimes they'd drive a sled over it. Or you can just thrash it against something, which is a common practice today. You have, to, you have to thrash this wheat, and then you get out your winnowing fork and you toss it in the air so that the, so that the wind can drive away uh, the, the chaff and the stalk and stuff and the kernels fall. And then last of all, you gather up what's left and you sift that in a sieve because you're filtering out everything that isn't those kernels of grain. And he's like, this is what Satan wants to do to you. He wants to thrash the crap out of you. He wants to shake you down. He wants to sort you out. He wants to find out which one of you are real disciples by the most extreme testing. And so he is warning them. Imagine what that would be like, hearing that from Jesus. But he says, I have prayed for you. Imagine what that would feel like. I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail, and you, when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. It's kind of a, you know, it's kind of a weird statement, isn't it? I've prayed that you won't fail, but it kind of implies that he will fail. It's like, class... We're having a test. But don't worry. I'm confident that you will do well on the retake. (laughs) You know, it's like, (laughs) should I feel encouraged or discouraged by this? (laughs) But Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. He's like, no way. That'll never happen. I will never desert you. I'm ready for anything. But Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow today until you have denied three times that you know me. It's like, dude, by dawn, tomorrow morning, you'll be telling everyone that you don't even know who I am. Mark, in his account of the same conversation, gives us a little more detail, which is good. It says, Jesus said to them, you will all fall away. Because it's written, I'll strike down the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. But Peter said to him, even though all may fall away, yet I will not. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you that this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will deny me three times. But Peter kept in saying insistently, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. So you get this, the sense here. He's not just casually saying, no, no, I'm with you. He's like, dude, no matter what, even if everyone leaves you, I will be there. These are excellent intentions. Scene two. <laughs> this is a little later in the chapter. Jesus has been betrayed. He's been arrested. They've taken him off to trial, which is the beginning of a series of trials before the high priest and the Sanhedrin that will lead to his crucifixion. It says, Now they arrested Jesus and led him away and brought him to the house of the high priest. But Peter was following at a distance, which I think is to his credit, right? Probably by this point everyone has scattered, but Peter is hanging in. He's keeping his distance, but he's following along. And it says, after they kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter was sitting among them. So so they and them, that's the people who just arrested Jesus. Soldiers and uh, religious officials and a crowd. And And so Peter, I think quite bravely, is sort of hanging around in this crowd waiting to see what happens. And a slave woman, seeing him as he sat in the firelight and staring at him, so, so this slave girl begins to look at him, and you can picture him like looking away, but she's like, wait a minute. 
she said, this man was with him as well. I recognize this dude. But he denied it, saying, I do not know him, woman. And a little while later, another person saw him and said, you are one of them too. Yeah, yes, he's one of Jesus' followers. But Peter said, man, I am not. And after about an hour had passed, some other man began to insist, saying, certainly, this man was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you're talking about. And again in Mark, we get a little more detail. It says, he began to curse and swear, I do not know this man you're talking about. In the name of God, I have no idea. Stop accusing me of this. I, have, I swear before God I don't know. And immediately while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed. <laughs> oh. And the Lord says, then the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Now, this probably means that Jesus, you know, they're waiting outside for this trial. It could have been that they brought Jesus out while they deliberated, which they often did. It could be that they're moving him from one location to another. But at this very moment, he makes eye contact with Jesus. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had told him, before a rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. All right, so there's our story. It's a sad story, right? It's cringy when you read it. Because you've got these excellent intentions. Peter's intentions are admirable. I don't think for a second that Peter was being deceptive or that there was something in his character that was like untrustworthy. I think he meant every word he said and then in the moment did not have the nerve to follow through. I think it was a failure of courage, or maybe the best way to think about it is how Jesus framed it, which is to think about it as a failure of faith. Jesus prayed that his faith would not fail. And you know, we've, we've talked about faith in this series a couple times. It's that idea of entrusting yourself to someone, like entrusting yourself to God and, and being willing to put my actions in line with that, to bank on, on that. And so I think what happened here was if Peter failed to put into action the trust that he really did have in Jesus. He did trust Jesus, but maybe not as much as he thought, or at least not enough to be able to act in that moment. And so I think we should, we should analyze this. We should ask the questions we've been asking. What does this, does this passage teach us anything about ourselves? And you're like, no, I'm not in this story. That's Peter, dude. Uh, my takeaway is Peter was weak. <laughs> Leave it at that. No. Uh, I think that often in these stories, we're supposed to see a little bit of ourselves. I certainly see a lot of myself in Peter's story. Because I think that we overestimate the strength of our own intentions and faithfulness. Don't you? You know, I think that this is a normal thing, that we, that we think, I'm going to be a certain way, and then, and then it, we're not as faithful as we think. I think this is the same tension that a lot of us feel all the time. I do love Jesus. I love Jesus. I trust Jesus. But when I'm staring down the barrel of that actually costing me something, uh, it's a lot harder. You know, it's easy to judge Peter and be like, well, he shouldn't have said that or he should have followed through. But I mean, you know, he said that at a room full of, a, a table full of guys who were all agreeing with him and now they're all gone. Now he's alone in a crowd of hostels. Have you ever been seized by a first century violent mob? I haven't. I mean, do you know what crucifixion is like? When I was a teacher, we used to do this lesson with the eighth graders to illustrate this point, and it, we, it was about the uh, Declaration of Independence, right? So the thing they're supposed to learn is that they took this great risk. The signers took this great risk signing this document 
that outlined all these critiques against the king declared that they were not under his authority. And that made them criminals, and it put them and their lives and their, and their families at tremendous risk. And so after we studied it, what I would do is I would get out a piece of paper and I would say, all right, guys, here's an exercise. We're going to write our own Declaration of Independence against the school. And they're like, yeah, you know, and I'd be like, all right, so brainstorm. What are things you don't like about this school? You don't like how it's run. And, and I mean, they had a million things. And so I'd get a student to start writing them down and this and this and this. And I'd, and I'd go to Mon. I'd be like, what about the principal? You know, the king of the school. Oh, well, she's the worst. And here's why. And they'd write down, she never does this and that. Okay. It's a very offensive document that concluded with, we should not be under the authority of the principal or anybody else. And then I'd be like, now, who would ever have the guts to sign this? And always, there's, a, there's always a Peter in the class, you know what I mean, who's like, I'll do it, you know. And he'd go up there, and sometimes a few would sign. Sometimes there'd be a tipping point, and like everyone would sign. And then I would spring the trap. And I'd take the paper, and I'd hand it to a student, and I'd say, please deliver this to the office. And they're, and they're like, you're not, you're not serious. I'm like, oh, I'm serious. And they would begin to realize I was serious as the student left the room. And they'd be like, wait, you know, we're going to get in trouble. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> That's why I didn't sign it. <laughs> they didn't know that I had the principal in on it. So she would come down with the paper in her hand, and she'd say, Mr. Faust, what is the meaning of this? And I'd be like, hey, I didn't write that or sign it. I have nothing to do with that. <laughs> and she would start reading off the charges and the names of the signers. And I'm telling you guys, there were tears. Literally, these kids, <laughs> they wanted to die. She'd take out her walkie-talkie and get the security guy and be like, we're going to need more chairs and in-school suspension. <laughs> Clear my schedule, I'm going to be on the phone for the rest of the afternoon. And then we'd be like, psych! <laughs> Lesson learned. It is easy to be like, Peter, what a failure. I would never do. And you know what? Maybe you would have had more faith than Peter and the twelve and the multitude that followed Jesus. Maybe you would have been the one. Or... Maybe it's easy to say that in your chair in a climate-controlled room with a cup of coffee and not as easy in the moment. I think that we are actually prone to failures of faith. That all the time we intend to trust God and then don't the way that we think we're going to. And the truth is, I think if you walk with Jesus very long, you're going to pile up a list of spectacular failures. That's the truth. I've never met a Christian who's walked with God for very long who can't list their spiritual failures. And maybe it's a failure like this where I, I chickened out and I didn't come through and I, I didn't represent Christ. Or maybe it's that I tried something hard and it went terribly and now I don't want to try that ever again. Or maybe it's that there was a step of faith that I know he had for me and I shrunk away. Or maybe it's that there's a lesson that I knew he wanted me to learn, but I hardened my heart. Or maybe it was a moral failure that hurt people in my life that I care about. Or maybe I just kind of checked out on God this year. You know? Maybe I intended to follow him this year, and then, and then I got distracted, and then other things came up, and there's a lot going on in my life in this world, and all of a sudden I look down, and it's like, wait a minute, I never denied Jesus with my mouth, but I kind of did with my life. And I'm saying that because I, as I've talked to a lot of Christians this year, I think a lot of Christians actually kind of feel like that, feel like a, a, a low-key failure in the back of their mind, like this year, a lot happened this year, but I wasn't as faithful as I meant to be or as faithful as I thought I was going to be. Well, luckily, the lessons of this passage do not stop there. 
what does this passage teach us about Jesus? And I think for that we should go back to what he said to Peter before Peter failed. He said, Satan has demanded to sift you men like wheat. And what I really like about this passage is that Jesus anticipated their failure. He told them up front, you guys are going to fail. And I think, for me, that takes a big load off. The fact that Jesus knew that and wasn't particularly freaked out by that fact, he's like, you guys are going to be tested, and some of the time, maybe a lot of the time, you're not going to pass that test, and I already know that, and I knew that when I went to the cross in your place, and I knew that when I invited you to follow me, and I knew that when I committed myself to you eternally in the Holy Spirit, I already knew that you were going to fail, and I pray for you, which I'm so glad that it says this, because that That right there tells you everything that you need to know about his attitude. He's not aloof. He's not like, I don't care what you do. And he's also not standing there in judgment with a microscope being disappointed in everything that we do. What's he doing? He's praying for us. He's like, I am right there. I am attentive. I am concerned about your failures, but I am right there alongside interceding and rooting. I am involved. I have skin in the game in, on your life. And what did he pray? He prayed that your faith will not fail. Which is, confu- you know, so what? Did Jesus' prayer not get answered or what? Well, that word fail there is the word that they would use for like a total eclipse. It's like totally fail. So I think what Jesus is saying here is, You're going to be tested beyond what you can bear, but I pray that your faith will not totally fail, that in your failure you will not quit, that you will not give up your faith as you fail. And the other thing we see here is that Jesus has a vision for us beyond our failures. So he anticipates our failures. He's right there struggling alongside us in them and praying and interceding. And he already has a plan for beyond our failures. He's like, when you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. Strengthen your brothers. And what does that mean, to strengthen your brothers? Well, for that, I want to check out one more scene, scene three. Now, I'm flipping over to John chapter 21, the last chapter in John, Jesus has gone to the cross, he's died, three days passed, and he rose from the dead. He has appeared to numerous people at this point, and this is an account of one of those appearances. It says, after these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and he manifested himself in this way. Simon Peter, and Thomas, and Nathaniel, And the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we will also come with you. And they went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. I can relate with this passage so far. (laughs) But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. There's just a figure on the beach over there. So Jesus said to them, Children, you do not have any fish, do you? They answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you will find a catch. Now that's dumb advice, right? You're fishing on the left side all day. Try the right side. So they cast, and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Therefore, the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's how John refers to himself, John said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now, how did he know that? He knew that because he's having deja vu. You know, he's like, this ha- I know this, and I love this because what is Jesus doing? He is recreating the scene where he first called Peter. 
And I think that's kind of tender because, you know, haven't you want, like, what's this going to be like, Jesus and Peter? What is Jesus going to say? Is he going to be like, told you, you know? Or is it going to be worse than that? What happens in the first century when you deny your king and throw him under the bus and break an oath to him? What happens in the stories of the Greek gods when you betray a god? Horrible, horrible things. And yet here's Jesus reaching out to him in the same way he did on the first day. So the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put, out, he put his outer garment on, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. Classic Peter. But the other disciples came in a little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 100 yards away, dragging a net full of fish. So Peter flings himself, splashes to the shore. Everyone else sensibly rose in. <laughs> when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish placed on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have now caught. Simon Peter went and drew the net to the land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, okay, what's he going to say? He said, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, shepherd my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Jesus anticipates our failures. He's with us in them. And he forgives our failures. It's very important. His expectation isn't that we'll never fail. He's ready to forgive. And I think this is a scene of forgiveness. You know, what's happening in this scene? Jesus is, is initiating a restored relationship with Peter. He's pulling him aside, so let's deal with what happened. This is something God does, constantly initiating reconciliation with us. And you say, well, how can he do that? Shouldn't Peter have to, like, do some laps or something? You know, what about what he did? And the answer to that question is Jesus can do this because of what he has done in the time that's elapsed between the last time he saw Peter, which is that he has gone and paid for every sin of man, past, present, and future. And so for this reason, he can say, blank slate, let's be reconciled. Some other things going on in this passage. One is he says, do you love me more than these? Who's that? Well, I think he's referring to the other disciples, right? Because remember, I think he's bringing to mind Peter's boast. Even if everyone betrays you, yet I will not. I love you most. And he's like, so do you still love me most? And then he asks him three times, why the repetition? And Peter got it because he was grieved at the end, right? It's for the three denials. This is like a systematic reckoning for each point of Peter's failure, his pride and hubris, his comparison, his threefold betrayal. And you think, <clears throat> why is Jesus doing this? Because here's, a, here's an important point not to miss is that Jesus, in love, exposes our failures. You say, why is he doing this? Is he just being cruel? You know, is he rubbing Peter's nose in the fact that he failed? Now, I think he's doing this, he does this so that we can have real and complete resolution. God does not 
resolve problems the same way we do. You know, we have a problem between us. The way we tend to resolve it is we tend to be like, well, I'll just look the other way or I'll sweep it under the rug. We like to say, I'll get over it, which means I'll let enough time pass that the feelings aren't quite so strong. Or maybe I'll justify it. Or maybe I'll spread the blame around. Jesus doesn't do any of that. He doesn't come to Peter and be like, hey man, don't worry about it. You know, let's just pretend it didn't happen. He doesn't say, he doesn't say you know, it's not your fault. They all betrayed me too. And you tried, you know. And, and hey, some time's gone by, I'm over it. He doesn't say any of that. He says, you failed here, 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 here. I love you and I accept you. I think that he does that so that we can have real and complete resolution. God does not overlook anything. He's just. He never overlooks anything, but he, but he did shed his blood for everything. So he all the way sees our failure, and he all the way forgives. The other thing is you can't learn anything from failures that you don't fully own. Isn't that true? I talk to Christians who are hung up on past failure, sometimes way in their past. And a lot of times they have some of the ingredients. I know God forgives me. I know I should move on. But there's some piece missing, and I think a lot of times that's the missing ingredient is that they've never really owned and said, okay, but here's what was on me. Here's the part that's on me. Because when we fully own our failure, then we can fully experience his grace. You can't fully experience his grace if you're not ready to take ownership for your failure and its consequences. So this may seem cruel. In our culture, we think of this as cruel. It's always cruel to enumerate someone's failures, but not to Jesus because Jesus intends to redeem all of these. One other thing I want to point out that is lost in the translation when we read it, there's all this, do you love me? You know that I love you. One thing that's kind of curious, and I don't, I'm not certain about how to interpret this, but I, I have a hunch. The passage uses different words for love. Jesus says, Simon, do you agape me more than these? That in the Bible is the highest love. That's godly love, sacrificial love. Do you love me with everything you've got? And Peter said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I philia you, which is brotherly love, like Philadelphia, which is good love, but it's not agape, right? It's a lesser love. So again, Jesus says, Simon, do you agape me? And Peter says, Lord, you know that I philia you. And then the third time, Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you philia me? And he says, you know that I do philia you. That's interesting, isn't it? What I think's going on here is I think that Peter is, you know, what, what, would, what would the Peter that we've come to know have said to this? Do you agape me? Of course I agape you, more than anyone, to the death. I think Peter's saying, clearly I don't love you as much as I thought I did. I do love you, but I cannot say that I love you all the way. And I think what's beautiful about this is that you see Jesus kind of meeting him where he's at. Okay. Do you philia me? Yes. Jesus is saying, you don't have to pass every test to be right with me. I think that's why it says that Peter was hurt that third time. But it, I think what we're seeing here is a more mature Peter. This is a different Peter from here on out. This is a Peter who's been refined by failure. Peter, who has a more realistic view of himself. And that's one more point, is that Jesus works through our failures to refine our character. And he does. He absolutely does. How does he do that? Well, it teaches us humility, like we just saw in this passage. It teaches us our own deficiencies and blind spots and limitations, which is painful. 
It teaches us to depend less on ourselves and more on him when we fail. That's a lesson that we all need to learn. It teaches us the depths of his grace. And, the, and it gives us that humble confidence that can only come when we're depending on his power and love. Well, our confidence based on ourself is fragile. But confidence based on his love and grace is rock solid. And it, it motivates us to love others with the same compassion with which we were loved. When you have failed and been loved by God, boy, it makes it a lot easier to love others around you when they fail, because they do. We don't get a do-over on our failures or their consequences but we always have another chance in our relationship with Jesus. We don't get a do-over on our failures or their consequences, but he always has a plan for our restoration. We don't get a do-over on our failures, but he's always working to grow us, and we always have the next opportunity to be faithful. And that's what's so cool in this exchange. What does he point Peter to? He's like, okay, tend my lambs. You know, if you love, what should Peter do if he loves God? He's like, just do this. Love these brothers. Strengthen your brothers. What do you get the God who has everything? (laughs) The best thing that you can do for God is to love people because that's what he does. He loves people and that's what his life was about And he says, that's what your life should be about, Peter. And I think a desire to serve others is the natural response to experiencing his grace. When we're loved by him, it it turns us outward. It takes our failures and turns them outward. And that's exactly what happened with Peter's life. If you read on through the book of Acts, I mean, you see a transformed Peter. You see Peter at Pentecost boldly proclaiming Christ Thousands of people coming to know him, Jews and Gentiles. You see Peter doing miracles, healing people, leading the church. And very significantly, you see Peter standing up under immense pressure. You know, later on in Acts, Peter himself is brought into that exact same place where Jesus stood. The place where he failed, Peter himself would be standing before the high priest and the Sanhedrin in not very long. And he stood his ground. He defied them to the point of imprisonment and beating and indeed, at the end of his life, death in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus' prayer was answered. Peter's faith truly did not ultimately fail. And I think Peter agaped him. There's a saying... It's kind of a derivative of a a passage that he who's been forgiven much loves much. And boy, have I seen that. You know, in my life, when I talk to Christians who are, who are, you know, the most mature, who are the most dedicated to serving other people, who are making the biggest impact for, for Jesus, they are not the people who failed the least. A lot of times they're the people who failed the most, but that they kept going back and letting that failure refine them and letting Jesus Christ redeem those failures. And you know what else is they don't mind talking about it. They're not like, I'm glad I failed. They're like, it was terrible that I failed. But man, I learned so much from it. And man, I'm, I know that I'm forgiven and accepted and that those lessons are valuable. So Jesus, he takes those failures He doesn't just move past them. He actually uses them to transform us. Failure shouldn't mean the end of your course. It can if you respond in pride, if your faith is totally eclipsed in the midst of your failure. You could choose that. But it should never never be. Failure should not mean the end of your course. It is a very important part of the course and a frequent part of the course. In fact, I would say if you're not experiencing spiritual failure, if you can't remember the last time you had a failure of faith, may I suggest you may be playing it too safe. And it's only truly failure if you quit. 
That's right. It's only really failure if you quit. Well, so if you came here today and you're like, man, I've got a failure. What should I do with it? You know, I don't know. Maybe you feel thrilled with how this year went for you. Maybe you feel thrilled about your faithfulness to God, or maybe not. I don't know. But I think either way, the answer is the same for all of us, which is we got to ask the question, what about now? I was talking to a home church leader recently who was like, we made our mantra for this year in our home church, what about now? (laughs) You know, all this stuff happened last year, good stuff, bad stuff, unexpected stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what about now? And that just stuck in my head because I thought, boy, that really, that really goes right with the spirit of this passage. Did you fail? Okay, well, don't be surprised. Make sure to draw near to Jesus. Go ahead and own it. Receive grace and let that blow your mind and then pick up your net and your shepherd hook. Come on. What about now? All right, well, that's what I had for, uh, for Peter and Jesus. Pretty encouraging for a teaching on failure, right? 